Hello and welcome to Down the Scoop. Today we'll be looking at the anatomy of shark skin or the integumentary system. As usual, you can access fully zoomable digital versions of all the slides via the website at downthescoop.co.uk. Links to the slides are in the video description. This is slide 249. Just as in other vertebrates, the skin of the dogfish can be divided into two regions, the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis consists of the more superficial layers of cells with the dermis underneath. There is often a layer deep to the dermis called the hypodermis, which is equivalent to the subcutis in mammals. In sharks, the epidermis can be split into three layers. The layers closest to the dermis is the stratum basale and is formed of a single layer of columnar to cuboidal cells. These cells divide and replenish the cells in the layers above them. Next comes the stratum spinosum, so called because you can sometimes see bridges of cytoplasm between the cells, giving them a spiny appearance. Finally, there is the outermost layer called the stratum superficiale. Although most of the cells here are epidermal cells, there are a few other cell types mixed in. For example, free nerve fibres will reach the stratum superficiale, providing sensory input for the skin, although we can't see them in these sections. You'll notice that there are large numbers of secretory cells amongst the structural epidermal cells. Some of them are quite large, and you can appreciate, for example here, that they're filled with mucus, which is squashing the nucleus against the cell membrane. In this section, you can even see some of the secretory cells extending to empty their contents onto the stratum superficiale, like this one here. From light microscopy alone, it's difficult to know if there is more than one kind of secretory cell in the skin. Perhaps the larger cells with darker staining contents are a different cell type to the ones with lighter staining content. Or they may simply represent the same cell which is so full of content as to alter its appearance. In one paper, I found reference to specialised holocrine cells. Holocrine cells are secretory cells which release their contents by rupturing their cell membranes, destroying themselves in the process. An example in mammals is the sebaceous glands. It's possible that these larger cells with foamy cytoplasm are holocrine cells. Wherever they come from, the secretions covering the shark skin will help to defend against bacterial and parasitic infection. If we switch to slide 244 and look at the epidermis, we can appreciate the layers as well. Here we have the stratum basale, the stratum spinosum and the stratum superficiale with mucus cells in between the structural cells. However, we can also appreciate another kind of cell just below the stratum basale of the epidermis. All of these round black cells, like this one here, are melanocytes which produce melanin and give the skin colour. The cytoplasm is filled with pigment granules which obscure the detail of the nucleus. Returning to slide 249, we can venture down into the dermis. The dermis is also made up of layers. That immediately below the epidermis is called the stratum laxum. Here we can make out loose connective tissue interspersed with blood vessels that will be providing the epidermal cells with the oxygen and nutrients they need to survive. The layer below that is formed of dense compact collagen fibres and is therefore called the stratum compactum. The difference in structure between the two layers is quite striking. The fibres in the stratum compactum are arranged horizontally in bundles which cross each other at an angle of 40 to 70 degrees. The purpose of this layer is to act as a kind of total body tendon which allows the body to remain stiff against the increased pressure of water caused by fast swimming. This tendon acts almost like an exoskeleton and helps to transmit the energy of muscle contractions to move the vertebral column. So in a sense the dermis in sharks is part of the locomotion system allowing them to swim faster. Along with these collagen fibres are elastic fibres which will allow the dermis to stretch and not rupture when it's put under forces of rapid swimming. Below the dermis, sometimes there are further blood vessels and loose connective tissue, as here where the fin joins the body. In other locations, the stratum compactum directly contacts the underlying muscle.
Moving on from the dermis, we come to one of the main features of shark skin, the scales, or to give them their full name, ectomesodermal placoid scales. We can find the best sections on slide 249 covering the pectoral fins. Early jawed fish like this placoderm had large bony plates covering their skin for protection. Similarly, the scales of sharks are made of bone, but there are a more refined version which have evolved to better perform their functions, principally to reduce friction drag with water and make swimming easier. Additionally, scales provide protection against abrasion, predators and parasites. It's even been shown that in juvenile dogfish, the scales play a role in feeding behaviours. Scales are not permanent fixtures in the skin, rather they are constantly renewed and shed. This means that we should be able to find examples of different developmental stages within our sections. Slide 237 has the best view of the first stage of development. Here we can see an example of a dermal papilla. A group of mesodermal cells or connective tissue cells has begun to collect in the dermis below the epidermis. The outer layer of cells here will specialise into a type of cell called an odontoblast. As the dermal papilla grows, it begins to contact the epidermis like this dermal papilla here. Switching back to slide 249, we can see the next stage of development. Here, the odontoblasts have secreted this solid black material, which is dentin. This will become calcified, forming bone. The layer of epidermal cells covering the dermal papillae are called ameloblasts and will secrete enamel, which covers the scale, providing a further hard layer. The scale itself remains living tissue with a pulp cavity supplying blood and nerve endings. All of this terminology like odontoblasts, ameloblasts, dentin, enamel and pulp cavity will have many people thinking of teeth. If you look at the mouth of slide 244, you'll see that the developing teeth are forming in a similar way to the scales. In fact, shark teeth are just modified scales which constantly renew. What's more, our own teeth and those of other vertebrates are even further modified scales, inherited from a previous scaled ancestor. Also in this slide, we can see more developed scales which are protruding through the epidermis from their dermal anchors. Lastly, it's worth having a look at slide 240, where we can see an element of the shark's sentry system associated with the skin and underlying tissue in the nose. Just in front of the olfactory epithelium, there is an expanded hypodermis filled with odd, almost glandular structures. These are the ampullae of Lorenzini, which help the shark to detect electric fields generated by prey, helping them to hunt. They can be useful in the final stages of catching prey or to detect animals hiding under the sand. Just here there is a great example with the pore nearly opening onto the surface of the skin. At the base we can see a thickened area of epithelium with a wispy cell surface. These are the cilia of the sensory cells that detect electric currents. Another good example can be seen here where a long duct heading from the skin culminates in a widened area with ciliated cells lining the epithelium. We can even see some nerve fibres, such as these here, making their way through the connective tissue and connecting to the bulbs of the ampullae to take sensory information to the central nervous system. The bulbs and ducts of the ampullae of Lorenzini are filled with a thick gel-like substance. This schematic shows how abundant they are on the face of a shark. As to how these cells detect electric fields, all I can do is point you in the direction of a review article which holds the answers because a full discussion of the topic is beyond the scope of this video. So that's a quick review of skin and associated structures in the dogfish. If you want to know more, I can recommend the article Basics of Skin Structure and Function in Elasmobranchs, a review by W. Mayers and U. Siegers, which I used as the primary source of information for this video. A link to the article is in the description. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to find an answer for you. And don't forget to subscribe for more videos on the anatomy and histology of the dogfish and other animals. If you want to see slides of tissue from other animals, you can visit the website. There's a link in the comments. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.